Good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to everyone from us at the Free Market Foundation. I'm Colette Murray, the newbie on the block, otherwise known as the project manager. <laughs> and um, before we start, I'd like to just remind you of our a million rand fundraising campaign that starts today. Uh, for every donation made, we have a very generous donor who will meet that with a 50% donation towards that donation. And uh, for further information, you can refer to our website. And also remember that it's tax deductible. So um, with any further, out with any further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker. It's a pleasure to welcome you, John. John Fund is... A, a national affairs com uh, columnist for, for National Review magazine and a contributor to Fox News Channel. He is often quoted a, a, a quoted expert on American <coughs> politics and the interconnection between politics, economics, and legal issues. He previously served for 27 years as a columnist and editorial board member at the Wall Street Journal. While at the Wall Street Journal Europe, he covered the collapse of communism and has reported for over 20 countries before beginning his journalist career as a reporter for the syndicated columnists Roland Evans and Robert Novak. He worked as a research analyst for the California legislature in Sacramento. John is also the author of several books, which include Obama's Enforcer, Holder, Holder's Justice Department, that was published in 2014, Second book was Who's Counting? Bo Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk, published in 2012, and The Dangers of Regulation Through Litigation, published in 2008. Roll Call, the newspaper of Capitol Hill, called him the Tom Paine of modern congressional reform movement. John has won awards from the Institute of Justice, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and the Fund for American Studies. So John, we'd love to welcome you, a warm welcome to you, and we're looking forward to sharing with you tonight. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Colette, and for your maiden voyage as a presenter and introducer, you did very well. I um, have a personal note that I'd like to begin with. Um, Colette mentioned that I've reported from many countries, but few have touched my heart and my brain as much as South Africa. I've only visited here once before, 30 years ago this month, December 1988. It was a different time. Uh, there's been much change. Um, very, very much for the better in many cases, some middling and some not so much. And I'm looking forward to learning more. And I'm looking forward very much to your questions because I'm here to speak not just to lecture you, but to learn from you and to learn your thoughts about the contemporary South Africa and from all of your perspectives. My first knowledge of South Africa in depth came in 1983 when I attended a conference in Cambridge, England. And now, this is, will be, this is a trivia question that I suspect not many of you will be able to answer, but very few would. But I know at least one person in this room would. How many of you know the Professor W.H. Hutt? Okay, that's not that word that I expected. I know Eusti Stavies did. I met him at a conference in Cambridge, England. I think he was 85 years old then. He lived a few more years. And he had come to South Africa from Britain in 1928 and taught for many years at the University of Cape Town. And he is most famous for, in 1964, having written a book called The Economics of the Color Bar, which was an attack on apartheid. Yes, of course, implicit in that, an attack on its morality, but also on its economics and also on the preposterous realization that he'd come to that it was the most outrageously complicated social engineering project ever known to man and doomed to failure, if for no other reason than that. Um, I met him, I chatted with him, I became fascinated by South Africa, which he had an abiding interest in. And I'll, I re here's a quote from the Economics of the Color Bar, which I think give a sense of the flavor of his book. 
Um, what is holding black back opportunities for all South Africans? The subjugating force is universally through what we usually call in writing dispassionately the interventionist, collectivist, or authoritarian system. Unchecked state power or the private use of coercive power tolerated by the state tends deliberately or unintentionally, patently or deviously to repress minorities or politically weak groups. Thus, the effective color bars which have denied economic opportunities and condemned non-whites to, to be hewers of wood and drawers of water have all been created in response to demand for state intervention by most of South Africa's political parties. And I cannot find a better summation of what the Free Market Foundation is all about opposing than uh, the points made in that quote. And I think the Free Market Foundation has done a fine job, often under very lonely circumstances. And I think that you're, you serve a need that is even greater than ever before today. In 1988, I came and I was very, very happy and lucky to be educated by some people that I've gotten reacquainted with. Uh, Leon Lowe, who couldn't be with us, who was successfully recovering from a hip operation. I just spoke with him on the phone and he sends you his very best. Leon has been an inspiration. He and Francis Kendall wrote the book, The Solution, which shaped a great deal of my thinking about uh, ways to end apartheid peacefully. Um, I'm going to be lucky to see Professor Louise Tager. Uh, is she, does she happen to be in the room? Oh, well, so we'll be seeing each other again. You also hosted a dinner party that was a great inspiration to me, and you brought a wonderfully eclectic group of people. And I, I can't, even though with the distance of 30 years, I can't thank you enough for how much you educated me on South Africa. I got to have breakfast with Bobby Godsell uh, this morning, and there'll be others that I can't mention. Um, Sadly, someone who greatly influenced me is no longer with us. Uh, Pro Jack, who was an ANC activist in Cape Town, was mediating disputes between taxi drivers and the monopoly taxi companies. Uh, he had a great impact on my thinking, and sadly he was murdered by people unknown. Even the Reconciliation Commission has never gotten to the bottom of it completely, and he was murdered in 1991, and may rest in peace. But he too was a great fighter for freedom and greater opportunity in South Africa, and I greatly miss him. Now to the topic at hand. I don't know quite how to address this topic in a completely serious way. <laughs> so I'm not. Uh, my questions will be very, very serious in the answers, because I'm sure you'll ask very serious questions. So I'm not here in the role of an entertainer, but can you possibly not try to make light of events in the United States the last few years? I think not. So just as the South African government sometimes presents opportunities for the theater of the absurd and for satire, I can assure you that our government, you know, as the number one economic power in the world, we're also the number one supplier of political fodder for satir satirists. I thought that I was really smart in the 2016 election. Even though when pressed I said, well, Donald Trump had a 35% chance of winning, uh, and I was wrong, but I was more right than almost everyone else, uh, I usually would try to elide the answer by saying, well, here's my prediction for the 2016 election when I was addressing audiences. I would say the next president of the United States, this is when he was running against Hillary Clinton, the next president of the United States will be 70 years old, will be active in New York politics, and whose blonde hairdo will not be real. <laughs> I thought I'd covered my bases completely. And sure enough, obviously, one of, those, one of those candidates did win. So, I'm going to try to give a very quick overview because I want to get to your questions fairly quickly. And pardon me if I occasionally refer to my notes because I do want to be completely correct in giving you uh, the facts that I lay out. Donald Trump is someone I've known for 29 years. Um, he's not a friend, but he may not have any friends. Um, he certainly has people, though, that he um, has had contact with over the years who have noticed some interesting personality quirks. If you want to know 
the most important thing about Donald Trump's personality, which so impacts his policies as president, uh, I would tell you that he's the only human being I've ever met who has both forms of ADD in terminal condition. <laughs> ADD, as you know, is attention deficit disorder. And there are two varieties. One is the children's variety. A child cannot pay attention. Then there's the adult variety. The adult needs attention. <laughs> I know who's going to be standing up first and asking a question <laughs> at great length. <laughs> and it'll have nothing to do with the, with the content of my talk, because you would have heard it. <laughs> um, have, I've had conversations with Donald Trump, and they've always been very amusing. Because, he, actually, I think he does occasionally listen. But he, he actually enjoys giving you the impression he doesn't. So my conversations with him have frequently been, I'm supposed to be interviewing him, and instead he lectures me and it completely ignores my question and answers the question he wants to answer. So they've been, it's been an interesting crossing of ships in the night. The reason I bring up those personality quirks is they probably explain most of the fact that this presidency is the most unusual we've had ever. Andrew Jackson, the previous populist who served in the 1830s, comes a little close once in a while. But no, Donald Trump, and this is an overused and misused word, is unique. So what happened in 2016? This is part of a worldwide phenomenon of populism by middle class and lower middle class voters that is sweeping the world. And I come not to praise populism or condemn it, but I'm here to explain it. And I think it's even touching South Africa in different ways, of course, because of your unique demography and history. Throughout the world, and it began with maybe the most visible early major manifestation was Brexit in June of 2016. Then it hit uh, the United States in November 2016. Since then, the rise of the alternative for Deutschland in Germany, uh, the rise of a um, very populist party to govern Austria, uh, the rise of Viktor Orban and Polish populists, the Italian populists have taken over the government, France is in flames, the, new, the second French Revolution perhaps may be on our doorstep, hopefully this time without bringing back the guillotine from the museums. And in Brazil, Trump of the tropics. Mr. Bolsonaro has just been elected overwhelmingly in Brazil, which is 140 million people. And what is behind all of this? Well, many factors. I, I believe that anything complicated is more than one explanation. But I'll focus on just one. In all countries that have a large middle class or an aspiringly large middle, aspiring large middle class, We have seen a great disappointment since probably the turn of the century, and certainly since the financial meltdown of 2008. For a variety of reasons, central banks have, almost without exception throughout the world, fueled equity growth rather than wage growth. In other words, if you hold capital, stock market, holdings, real estate, the central banks have been very good to you, and so have the federal policies of most of the central governments. And you're doing fine. In fact, the gap between you and those who depend on wages is perhaps greater than ever in most of those countries. Now, I'm not here to preach against inequality, but I'm here to warn against it, at least in its political impact, because it certainly creates anger, resentment, jealousy, all kinds of dark purple emotions that we try to repress. And it's understandable. Uh, why in the world is our government's increasingly ignoring the middle class and the lower middle class in favor of people on the top, and to some extent people on the bottom through very generous welfare states? So specifically, um, the British writer David Goodhart has talked about two groups of people that now make up a majority, a clear majority of the people in all of these Western democracies. He calls them 
the anywheres and the somewheres. The anywheres are in all of these countries about 20, 25 percent of the population. And they, well, I suspect at least probably a majority of the people in this room are anywheres. They're more educated than most people in the population. They're more professional in occupation than most people in the population. They have more wealth than most people in the population. And they're more cosmopolitan in their attitudes, less insular, travel more. Some aspire to be citizens of the world. Some, at the very, very top, aspire to be that old discredited term, the jet set. They're more secular than most of the general population. They're more liberal in their social attitudes and values than the general population. Um, more in favor of free trade, less worried about the impacts of immigration or trade with other countries on the lower cl middle, class or middle class of their country. And they generally dominate the media. So their message tends to get out far more than the message of anyone else. And they tend to live in cities. They tend to be urban. And they tend to, I, I don't say they condescend, but their general attitude towards the people in the towns they may have grown up in but have left and moved before they moved to the big city, their general attitude is somewhat dismissive or not particularly interested in their daily concerns. Uh, in other words, their message in many of these countries to the lower middle class or the middle class that are suffering this wage stagnation is sit down and shut up and listen to your betters. The, they're the anywheres. The somewheres are between 50 and 60 percent of the population in all of these countries. They are more rural or suburban or what is the term? They're not part of the um, metropolis but they're part of the micropolis um, around cities and they are more religious, more traditional, more rooted in their community more a believer that neighbors tend to help neighbors rather than hire someone to do it. Um, more a believer in small town values, which still have many virtues attached to it. They're not as highly educated. They're not as highly wealthy because of the growing gap between urban and rural areas. Those who live in cities are often old industrial workers or previously industrial workers that have lost their jobs or been transitioned into something else. They're somewheres. They're rooted in their country first, not international or multinational organizations. Far more they think about us in their community than they do the UN. Now, I'm not here to make a case for either or a case against. I'm here to explain. This divide, which is not so much on class lines or even racial lines, but value lines. What do you believe in? What's important to you? Uh, where do you see your place in the world? How do you see your country? Do, are you a patriot? Or are you someone who, yes, I like my country, I appreciate my country, but you know, I, I, I want to be a citizen of the world. That, these differing attitudes, these differing values, very much explain the different voting patterns we're seeing and the revolt against the elites that is sweeping all of the countries that I've mentioned and even more. So, specifically in the United States, we now have political parties that used to have coalitions often on geographical lines, who fought who in the Civil War, where we eradicated slavery, uh, or religious. Many Catholics used to be Democrats, many Protestants used to be ancestrally Republican. All of those lines are breaking up and we're having new coalitions form. So now each party is riding, like a human would ride an animal, an unruly coalition bucking bronco. Let me give you the Republicans first. And I'm putting this in African terms to perhaps have you appreciate it. The um, Republican Party has three major components now. The elephants. We're using safari terms. The elephants. 
These encompass both the religious right, traditionally ancestral Republicans, uh, staunch fiscal conservatives, uh, people who just hate socialism, people who formerly thought the Cold War was very, very important and opposition to communism extremely important. Uh, these are people who always have voted Republican and always will. The rhinos, to use another safari term, that stands in American parlance for Republican in name only. Moderates who haven't fully appreciated the conservative drift of the Republican Party to the right. Uh, we used to call them Rockefeller Republicans because Nelson Rockefeller used to be their standard bearer and almost was their, their nominee for president. And the rhinos have been under attack in recent years by the establishment Republicans and others uh, for being too moderate and too accommodationist with the Democrats. Uh, the hunting of the rhinos has not made them extinct, but we've seen in the last couple of elections, 2016 and 2018, that they may have migrated to a new habitat. The Democratic Party or third parties. And then we have the tigers. Uh, this is awkward, but I think it'll work. The tigers stand for Trump is great even for non-Republicans. <laughs> um, the Trump is great tigers, many of them are former Democrats. There are many of these somewheres who used to be members of labor unions or still are. They very much are concerned about trade and immigration, eroding wage rates and providing unfair competition. They're very much concerned, they're, very, they're generally socially conservative, much more patriotic than other blocks in the Democratic Party they used to belong to. And the Tigers made the difference in the election because there were enough of them in strategically important places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, Iowa, all of which Barack Obama carried in 2012, but swung to Trump. And because we have the Electoral College, which means you can lose the popular vote, as Trump narrowly did to Hillary Clinton, but you, if you win the electoral vote, college vote, which is cast by each state based on its population, you can win a majority. Trump ended winning up, winning by 306 to 229. Uh, a clear victory in the Electoral College, but he nearly lost the popular vote. So the, the rhinos, but, but it, wasn't, it was an uneven victory. Trump gained all of these voters in the Rust Belt, but in states where the margin was large enough that it didn't matter, Texas, Georgia, Arizona, places that still went Republican, a large number of people deserted the Republican candidate for president and voted for Hillary Clinton, didn't vote, or voted for a third party candidate, most often the Libertarian candidate, who was the former governor of the state of New Mexico. So you had this twin force of coalitions rearranging themselves. And I'll give you one example of how this has worked to the Democrats' advantage in the last midterms, where the Democrats took back the House of Representatives, which is the body we elect every two years, so it's the one that's closest to the people, most responsive to shifts in public opinion, as opposed to the Senate where the term is six years. Texas has a congressional district that's on the west side of Houston, a petrochemical city I know a lot of South Africans have visited. This is a district that has the Galleria Shopping Center, which uh, is easily the equal of anything you have in Santon or um, the other Tony suburbs here in northern Johannesburg. It is very Republican and very conservative. Mitt Romney carried it by 23 points in the 2012 election. Mitt Romney, the managerial Republican of the old establishment party. Two, four years later, Hillary Clinton carried the district by one percentage point. The swing was dramatic. Rhinos and Republicans who simply couldn't stand Trump's personality. This last midterm election, 2018, it elected a Democratic Congress person named Louise Fletcher for the first time since the 1960s. This is the district that elected George H.W. Bush to his first political office in 1966. This is the district that George W. Bush grew up in. 
This is the district where establishment and moneyed Republicans have raised campaign funds for eons. And that shows the, that, that district itself, going from Bush Republican to Democrat for Congress, encompasses the change of the midterms. It explains why the Democrats who won 48% of the vote for president in 2016 won 53% of the vote for the House of Representatives in 2018. Now I know people will say, yes, but the Senate went the other way. The Republicans gained two seats. Well, they did for two reasons. One, the map, because there's a different group of senators up every two years because of the six-year term. One-third of the Senate is up at any one time. The map, for various peculiarities, was heavily tilted in favor of the Republicans. Of the 34 seats they were, that were contested, they only had to defend 11. So in the end, they actually only won 13 out of 35, but that still, they still gained seats. And they won seats in districts where the, there were many more somewhere than in other states, North Dakota, Indiana, Missouri, places like that. So while the Senate certainly was a bright spot for Republicans and certainly will make it much easier to confirm Trump judges and Trump appointees and various other things, uh, it was a different electorate because it was a different, smaller, and more less representative electorate than the House vote, which was won all 50 states. So the other thing is on why Trump won is actually a very simple one. As you probably know, in South Africa, it is much easier to vote against something than for something. That's true almost in every democracy. We had a very interesting exit poll in 2016. 41% of people said they liked Hillary Clinton, which sounds okay until you realize it was the lowest percentage of any Democratic nominee in modern history. 37% said they liked Donald Trump, which isn't a horrible number until you realize that it's the lowest percentage of any Republican presidential nominee in modern history. And then you had 2% um, who said they liked both. <laughs> I would love to know who those people are. I'd love to sit down and, put, and meet with a psychiatrist and myself and we'd sit there and try to figure out their inner workings. Um, no, I won't speculate. It's, that's no off-color humor. Anyway, 18% said they hated both candidates, not disliked, hated both candidates. This is very unusual in polling. Hate is an extremely strong word. So what did they do? Because these people voted. This is an exit poll. They hated both candidates, but for reasons of civic duty or pride or the fact they just wanted to send a message, they voted for someone. Well, many broke for a third party, but Trump, in the end, won those people 47 to 30. That's what elected him president. Now, basically, it was a cho As one voter told me, this was a choice of the evil of two lessers. <laughs> but I decided to go with the devil I knew least rather than the devil I knew most. And um, I'd known they'd, they had followed the career of Hillary Clinton for 30 years. And as, this, as some commentator said on CNN, you could walk through her deepest ethics and not get your ankles wet. With Donald Trump, you probably wouldn't even get to the toes, but that's a separate story. But they decided to go with the devil that they knew least. So Trump was elected. And he was also elected because, frankly, his economic policies made more sense and were more coherent and better suited to the eight-year non-prosperity of the Obama years. Yes, the economy did improve after the financial crisis, but it was the slowest recovery we have ever had in our history, around 2% economic growth, which the average for America in the last 100 years, which includes several depressions and recessions, has been 3.5%. So Obama did many things right, many things wrong, but very, very mediocre performance on the economy. And there was this pent-up fear that, that Hillary was going to do worse and that we could do better. So a lot of people took a risk and a chance on Trump. 
Now, the 2018 midterms, as I said, I count as a victory for the Democrats. Um, they made it an anti-Trump campaign. Brilliant. They barely talked issues. Their biggest issues were climate change, which is the 24th most important issue, if you ask Americans what the important issues are. Uh, there are only 25 listed. Um, and they also brought up pre-existing conditions. Will health insurance companies cover you if you sign up for insurance and you have an existing health care problem? That's a serious issue, but it's not a national campaign of ideas, I can assure you. And whoever is the Democratic candidate for president in 2018 is going to have to have something more substantive. They'll have to have a platform, a party platform. So it was a victory for the Democrats. They brought a lot of first-time voters in. In 2018, most of those people either stayed home or voted Democratic. They didn't vote Republican. So there is a concern among Republicans that they have lost part of their traditional coalition. Just as there's concern among Democrats about those Rust Belt blue collar workers who went for Trump. So that's what gave the Democrats their majority. Interestingly, is who didn't shift from 2016. Latinos, Trump got 31% of Latinos, despite all of the, you know, attacks on Mexican immigrants and saying Mexico is going to pay for a wall. Um, African Americans, no improvement, none. Still overwhelmingly Democratic, but no improvement. Uh, Asians, no improvement. Trump voters in the Rust Belt states, they stuck with the Republicans. They voted for those candidates, which explains those Senate gains the Republicans made. So each party has very unstable coalitions. And I don't need to remind you, but you live in a parliamentary democracy. Every Western country has, um, with every major Western country has a parliamentary democracy. You vote for a member of parliament. They form a coalition with other parties. That's how you run things. We do not have that system. We're the only one that's different. We have a two-party system rigged by the two parties to make sure that third party candidates and independents don't succeed. And that means we have a very different way of getting power for people. You have to win 51% of the vote, assuming there are two major candidates. You have to win a majority. You have to have a very wide and broad coalition, bigger than the one political parties and parliamentary democracies have to have. That means you're going to have to have a coalition that includes an awful lot of people you would never invite home for dinner. You may have only one thing in common with them. It may be just a common enemy, but that's enough. So these coalitions are very broad, very diverse, and unstable. Because if you satisfy one of those groups within the coalition, you may anger or alienate another group. I'll give you an example. The Democratic Party is moving left fast. In 2004, 62% of Democrats who voted in the primaries for the Democratic Party described themselves as moderate or conservative. By 2016, when Hillary Clinton defeated Bernie Sanders, and not by much, it was down to 36%. The Democratic Party is moving left. That's how Bernie Sanders was able to get 40% of the vote against a former senator and former secretary of state. If the Democratic Party continues to move left and nominates a candidate who is very left-wing, that may be Donald Trump's salvation, despite all of the personality issues, the policy issues, and the other concerns people have. The Republicans have another problem, which is their best educated and wealthiest voters are now with the Democrats, at least at the midterm level. They either get them back or they secede them, cede them to the Democrats. If they do, that makes it very, very difficult to get a majority. However, a left-wing candidate who wants to raise taxes, who wants to increase regulation, both of which have been cut under Trump and have spurred an economic growth of almost 4% in part, 
that may be enough to keep them at home or reluctantly vote for Trump. I personally think there's a 35 or 40 percent chance Trump does not run for re-election. We can go into the details of that during your questions. But we're operating under the assumption that he does. Um, I can tell you the day that if Donald Trump ever does announce that he's not running for a second term, the sigh, the sigh of exasperation and disappointment and wailing and gnashing of teeth you will hear will be the entire Democratic National Committee about to slit its wrists. <laughs> so in conclusion, the GOP coalition is unstable. It hasn't addressed immigration versus trade. It has two wings. One is basically tolerant of immigration and supports free trade. The other wing does not. The Democratic Party has a coalition that's so broad it includes many new members of Congress that are members of the Democratic Socialists of America. And it also includes people like Joe Biden, who's a very traditional Democrat and always thought Barack Obama was way too left wing for him and has privately been telling people since he left office that he's not going to campaign on those platforms. In conclusion, this is a very parlous moment for our country in America. Our founding fathers had a vision of a country in which a lot of things that created tensions and war in Europe would not infect American politics, especially religious conflicts. They set a separation of church and state and a freedom of religion to try to defuse questions of morality and values that were binary. There's either yes or no. You believe in a certain God or you don't believe in a certain God. You have a certain moral attitude towards something or you don't. And America is still the most religious of the Western democracies, far more religious than any other. With, ironically, with the possible exception of South Africa, which has unusual demographic and historical trends. But we are clearly religious still compared to other countries. And the founding fathers wanted to diffuse that, take that out of the political realm. And what that meant is we wanted to have compromise and consensus rather than stark choices where people could lead to conflict like our Civil War. Slavery was one of those insoluble issues. You couldn't compromise it. You were either for it or against it. You were either tolerated it or, or found it abhorrent. And then we had a war and half a million people died to eradicate slavery. We wanted to avoid that. Now, we're less religious than we used to be, so the left wing in our country has moved to the courts as an arbiter for a lot of moral questions. They wanted homosexual marriage decided in the courts. They wanted um, universal health care decided in the courts. They wanted abortion decided in the courts. They wanted uh, whether or not um, a baker in Colorado could refuse to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Uh, because it was, he considered it a form of artistic expression that he shouldn't be forced into. A uh, variety of questions. The left wants the courts, which are our only unelected branch, to decide those. Conservatives tend to say, no, the courts should have a more limited role and this should be for the legislatures, or frankly, just not touched by politics. I personally believe judges are great people. Some of my best friends are judges, but I don't think they're I don't think they have the wisdom of Plato's Republic. Um, my personal belief is there are a lot of questions that shouldn't be in the political realm. And the more that we try to stuff them in the political realm, the more that we engender conflict. Uh, the vast majority of the American people on many issues will, don't want to pay a lot of attention to politics. They want to get down to the serious business of living, which is their family, their home, their hobbies, their job, their children. Um, their faith, and they don't want to have everything in our society dictated by politics. And that's one of the great divisions that I fear now, that we have people who want everything to be decided by politics, and we have people who, on the other extreme, don't see there's any social ill that needs to be addressed because it's just the way it is, status quo ante. And neither of those perspectives is in accord with reality or justice. So we're divided now in America along geographical lines, rural versus urban lines, emotional lines, values lines. And this is all made worse by my profession, the media. 
I don't have to tell you that we have a 24 7, 365 day a year um, media war going on in which basically a whole bunch of people want to stir up anger on television because that means ratings. I do a lot of t commentary on television for several networks. Um, I try not to watch it anymore. If I have a goal on tel about television, it is to be on it more than I watch it. I'll never get that far, but that's my goal. So I don't want to leave you c completely pessimistic about the state of America in the age of Trump, because I will leave you with that all-purpose Churchill quote, which, as Henry Kissinger would say, has the added advantage of being true. Churchill once said, Americans, he said, ah, Americans, they will always, always do the right thing, but first they must exhaust all of their possibilities. <laughs> and that's where we are. Thank you very much. How much time do we have for questions? Can you give me a rough idea? Whatever you wish. Do you want to call on the questioner? You might, or does that, so does someone who knows the audience want to call on the questioner? Because I don't, I don't want to be discriminatory. All right, I'll call on. Them. Yes. Could you stand up if you can? Because I want to make sure I don't have to repeat the question. If right. you can. Um, what is, what is your personal opinion of Trump? Is he a buffoon? Is he intelligent? Is he a charlatan? Is he, what is the guy? I like the easiest questions always being asked first. <laughs> what is your opinion, sir? He, to me, from time to time, he appears to be a buffoon. He's an exceptionally successful businessman. No, he isn't. That's actually a complete myth. He, okay. has many, he has many great successes in his life. Being a successful businessman is not one of them. All right, well, then I'm mistaken as far as that. That's well, they, they, you know, he does, look, every, the anti-Trump people have a propaganda machine and the pro-Trump people have a propaganda machine. Both, shall we say, have exaggerations, but go ahead. I just thought that, you know, he owns I, he, lots of real estate. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, you know, all of those buildings that have Trump on them, do you know how many of them he owns? None. One or two, maybe? No, he markets his name. He gave up real estate 15 years ago, 20 years ago. He puts his name on stuff. And because he has universal ID, he thinks just, he believes, and the people who pay for his name think that this brings more customers. It may or may not. Trump stakes didn't do so well. I heard they were a little tough and unforgiving. Um, Trump wine is a vanity product. The Trump airline went bankrupt. So, I mean, it's a mixed bag, but. Trump ties made in China are doing very well. So Donald Trump has his name on 159 products. He is a marketing genius. He's not in real estate anymore, barely. He, all right, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend the 15 minutes because this anecdote is so good, I'll, it, it's, worth, it's worth the minute it takes to tell it. A biography came out of Trump about 12 years ago, and it said he's not worth the four or five or six billion. He says he is. He's worth X, under a billion. Trump became furious. I mean, it's worse than attacking his manhood. Uh, so he sued the author, and his goal was to force him, because of legal bills, to uh, retract or to retreat from the claim. Well, this fellow had written one of the articles saying this in Forbes magazine, and Forbes magazine said, oh, we'll pay your legal bills. So they went to court. In American legal terms, I'm sure you have something similar to this. You have discovery. Each side gets to ask questions and get documents from the other. Trump had not had this very much in his life. His Bible is winning through intimidation. Um, so there was a famous deposition in 2008, and it's on the web. You can go read it, and I'm going to paraphrase it, so don't hold me to every word, but I'm severely close to what I'm about to tell you. So the question comes from the uh, lawyer defending the author. Mr. Trump, for the tenth time, how rich are you? Please provide a straight answer. Trump. Well. It all depends on a variety of complicated factors. 
And my wealth can vary greatly from day to day, month to month, year to year, based on extraneous factors which I have no control over, but which I follow closely. <laughs> what exactly does that mean? <laughs> Some mornings I will wake up and see there he is calling, right there, complaining. <laughs> There are some things, he says, that I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I feel really good and I feel really rich. And that's how rich I feel. And some mornings I wake up, like after I read that Forbes article that says I wasn't a billionaire, and I feel really poor. And I really feel that this, has, this article has hurt my wealth because if I underperform, I'm less wealthy. And this article attacked me, attacked my success and attacked my character and it has cost me lots of money, and I would be more wealthy if this article had not been written and these lies hadn't been told. So Mr. Trump, your wealth, which you refuse to specify with a number, is dependent on your feelings about your wealth. Yes, that's about right. <laughs> I don't know where you go with that, <laughs> um, except that um, to say that Trump lies is, is actually a very awkward thing to say because if you believe your lies, you're not really lying. So let's just put it this way. Trump engages in altered conceptualizations of reality. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> now, is he a buffoon? Absolutely not. Um, I would, how many of you have seen the movie Rain Man? Dustin Hoffman, Tom Cruise, okay. Rain Man is about someone who's completely awkward and limited in many areas, wouldn't want to invite him home for dinner, but He's brilliant. He can do binomial equations. He can calculate the value of pi to the nth degree. There's about five things Rain Man can do that mark him with genius. There's about five things Donald Trump can do that mark him for genius. I mean, there's no one who can p pick a nickname for an opponent, belittle him, and completely destroy the $100 million that someone like Jeb Bush spends to run his presidential campaign. Marketing. To get your name in 159 products is practically sheer genius. I don't think of anyone in the world who's done that. Uh, his ability to court and flatter the media while attacking them at the same time, knowing that they need him, is almost genius. I mean, the media has lost almost as much credibility as Donald Trump in the United States because they're obsessed with Donald Trump. He has won that argument. He has made it all about him. There is nothing in American politics that happens that doesn't revolve around Trump. Now, that often hurts him, but he's attacked the media enough that his base is still solid. He's still sitting at 45, 46 percent of the vote, which is what he got in 2016. So the answer to your question is he's a little bit of everything, but he's not a charlatan. He's very limited. He has yeah. obvious deep flaws, but do not underestimate him. His career in the last 50 years has been littered with people who underestimated Donald Trump. And he prevailed over almost all of them running for president when no one thought he could. Yes, in the back, way in the back. Quick question. Um, I'm going to move this way, so don't think I'm ignoring you over here. The, um, if you say that people don't want things decided in the courts. So the bake the cake. Well, some, many people yeah. don't. Some so, people do. Yeah, so the question is, that, let's take the bake the cake guy. No. I'm sorry? The bake the cake. You know, will he bake the cake? Yes, the, yes. If they don't want it decided in the courts, where do they want that sort of question decided? Well, let's just put it this way. I know the Baker case very well. And it was clearly a setup job, and that's fine. We do that all the time in our legal system, where two people went in wanting to have the baker refuse to make the cake so they could sue him in front of the Colorado Department of Human Rights or Civil Liberties or whatever that handles discrimination cases. And they wanted a test case which would say the baker has to make the cake and has to design the cake. Um, my view is that we have some immutable groups that have been decided by law deserve special protection in almost all areas. And that would be include rental, property, public accommodations, all those things. We have civil rights laws that we need to protect and extend. 
if you want to reach down to wedding photographers and to bakers, cake makers, all range of people who provide services and say, even if you take no affirmative steps to attack someone, to belittle them, you simply decline to provide business to them, if you extend that kind of micromanagement of human relations and consign that over to the state, you're going to have a different country. And I think that we can maintain our anti-discrimination laws in the United States without becoming that country. And I think there have to be some law lines drawn because there are, rights, there are lights in conflict. We have very strong laws for religious freedom. And the expressions of noncompliance that have come from people like bakers and wedding photographers are is, you know, I haven't said anything against anyone, but my faith tells me to go a different direction. So there's a conflict. And how that is resolved and what those lines are are very awkward. I just don't think the courts are the right place to draw those lines. I think whatever, if there are any lines that should be drawn, they should be drawn far more locally where people know the circumstances and the particular values of that community. And I don't, that doesn't mean to say any anti-discrimination laws need or should be dis dismantled. No, in some cases they need to be strengthened. But the, the obsession with extending your ideological preferences to every aspect of human relations goes too far and carries with it its own seeds of conflict between people. And also greater prejudice. You can go too far. Ask the gay writer Andrew Sullivan, who was the editor of the New Republic and now writes for New York Magazine, how far this has gone beyond what a, certainly what a classical liberal would advocate. His essays are very powerful and I commend them to your attention. Yes, In the, right back. I think we can say that uh, Donald Trump failed his diplomacy exams. But he you never was, said he wanted to take them. I know, <laughs> but if he took them, he would. He's, I think we all accept he's a super ego. And I'd like you to comment on his bully boy tactics and the way in which he actually got North Korea to actually come and start talking. Uh, to him and to other organizations as well? It's a very good question, and that's really complicated. I would say, in the case that you mentioned of North Korea, Trump failed miserably because he didn't really get anything. Uh, the North Koreans have been at this game since 1945, and they always play the same game, and it's basically, a, a, today it's a form of high-profile nuclear blackmail, and they've given Trump nothing except some bones of POWs from 1953. So bully boy tactic or whatever, it's failed in North Korea. Now having said that, it can work. Nikki Haley, who was probably going to be a Republican candidate for president in 2024, was the UN ambassador. I know her well, and she has told me and others that Trump was very useful to her at the UN. Because like Richard Nixon, who finally convinced the Vietnamese to come to the table at the Paris Peace Talks in 1973 because he started bombing all of North Vietnam, and the North Vietnamese were told by Kissinger, you have no idea how what this madman will do next. <laughs> <laughs> um, it worked in places like China. I think China will eventually make concessions on trade because Trump is so unpredictable. And by the way, you saw the recent report that the Chinese economy has done has its worst performance in seven or eight years. And by the way, they cover it up, but there are... A riot in China is defined as more than 50 people gather in which there is a violent or near-violent disturbance. There are 600 of those every day in China. China is not a necessarily a peaceful country. The, the resentments that I mentioned about the wage stagnation and working conditions, they're there. So the Chinese have actually given in a little bit to Trump. Um, NATO, NATO had promised years ago, all of our members will pay and spend 2% of GDP on defense. I think two out of 23 did. And now they are. And the, the Secretary General of NATO, 
a Norwegian whose name I temporarily forget, has actually said publicly, Donald Trump did us a favor because by threatening us with a reduced American role in NATO and a reduced contribution in NATO, he forced us to finally write checks. That's the Norwegian Secretary General of NATO. So, look, I don't admire bully boy tactics. I don't admire winning through intimidation. But if your question is, does it always fail? No, it doesn't always fail. Is it fraught with peril, and should it be used sparingly? And is it potentially could create a major situation? Yes, but I also think it would be well short of war. I don't think Trump is actually a warlike figure. I think he's a bully who doesn't want to fight. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, and I hate to say this, I mean, she was behind one of the two greatest bombing campaigns the U.S. ever held, Bosnia and Libya. If you don't believe me, I can give you the historical citations. Bill didn't want to bomb, but she convinced him to bomb in Bosnia. Uh, Obama didn't want to bomb. She convinced him to bomb in Libya. By the way, Libya turned out really well. Um, so ironically, for all of his bulliness, if you want to coin a phrase, Trump's probably less likely to actually take us to war than most presidents. Although, you know, in his lack of attention span on ADD, anything can happen. <laughs> I'm gonna, I promise to go over here, yes. Uh, my name is Uphom, and I just have two questions, really. Uh, the first Can you make one, both of them short, if you have two? Yeah. Okay. The first one, uh, you mentioned divisions that you have uh, in, the, in the U.S. system. Now, I was wondering, along uh, scientific lines, if perhaps in your, uh, in your view, there could be some developing divisions along how the government relates to science. So that's the first question. Um, the second question is, uh, basically, with regards to Trump, I, I want to just gather what Trump's attitude is towards South Africa. I know he's left much of, uh, you know, many states with his uh, tariffs, but I'm just wondering what his attitude specifically to South Africa. What would it be? I think there's a lot of goodwill towards South Africa, but the the knowledge and interest in South Africa, I would frankly tell you, is limited. Um, you know, we stopped becoming irrelevant. You stop becoming a really relevant political issue in American politics the day Nelson Mandela was inaugurated. It's that simple. Having said that, um, you know, I've had several conversations here explaining to me why the proposed changes in Article 25 of your Constitution regarding the possibility that there could be zero compensation for government seizures of land or other property is not that important or that it would never really happen or I've heard all kinds of good explanations. Forget the reality, forget the facts, the perception would be devastating in parts of the United States. Not just the conservative community, not just Fox News, but I have to tell you, when, when Americans who have any political knowledge or sense, and I'm not saying they're knowledgeable about South Africa, they're not, but with, with they think they have knowledge and political sense about South Africa, if they hear the words, zero compensation for seized property, one word comes up in their minds, and it's called Zimbabwe. Now, that's not fair. It's two different countries. It's two different time periods. It's all kinds of things you can bring up. But if you don't understand that perceptions rule politics more than facts, well, I failed in my talk, because they do. So I hate to say this, but you know, often countries are better off if they're ignored by Americans. And I don't say that against my countrymen. It's just that that means we generally are friendly people. We generally like to cooperate with people. We like to trade with people. We like to think well of other people, even though we're profoundly ignorant of them. <laughs> it's a paradox. So if we don't pay attention to you, that's not entirely a bad thing. If we do pay attention to you, it's probably because of perceived bad news. And an example of that would be if you changed Article 25, regardless of the facts. Your first question about science, what exactly do you mean? Can you be more specific? Well, um, just if you look at uh, the Paris Accord, I mean, oh. change, you look at, and that's not just the only one. I mean, you look at, um, in terms of uh, the general attitude towards you know, the scientific community, you get the sense that it's different. So I just want to get the perception of that. You know, I'm going to say something that I almost never say, which is, you have opened a can of worms I cannot possibly comment in less than five minutes, because I don't want to get boxed into a canyon um, where you'd misunderstand me. 
Climate change is a far more complex subject than has been let on. I'm not an expert and I'm not a scientist. I know just enough to know how much more complicated it is than the simplified, you know, yes or no answers that people give. Yes, human activity has an effect on the climate. Is anything proposed today under the Paris Accords likely to affect that very much? Nada, zip, zero. And if you don't believe me, just go behind the scenes and ask what the Chinese, the Indian, and the Russian negotiators say about what they're likely to do in the future. Just go behind the scenes and ask what every developing nation in the world, where people want a car, where people want central heating, where people want air conditioning, where people want a refrigerator, including some people in this country, and ask them what economic burden they are willing to shoulder and countenance by their elected officials in order to perceive along the vague, proceed along the vague path of the Paris Accords. I respect the sincerity of the people who wrote the Paris Accords. I cannot possibly imagine that they take them as seriously as they say they do in public, because it would be preposterous. There are things we can do about climate change if you think it's a small problem, a medium problem, or the problem of the century. If we painted every household in the United States, the roof of every household in the United States, like in Phoenix, Arizona, white, we'd reduce the temperature there by one and a half degrees, which is more than it's risen in the last 20 years. If we invested a lot more in technology, along the lines that Bjorn Lomborg wrote in the Copenhagen Consensus, and I highly commend that book to you. I think 15 Nobel Prize winners contributed to it. We invested in technologies. If we followed what the Dutch did in the, 19, in the 1600s, starting with the problem of flooding, and you applied much more technology to the problem, you'd do an awful lot more than attempts at reducing carbon emissions, which are doomed to failure. If anyone in this room, if anyone in this room sincerely believes they can go to the government of Nigeria, or the government of Russia, or the government of India, and the government of China, and seriously convince them to, without cheating, without cheating, to actually reduce their carbon emissions, if you could present a plausible case to me that you could convince them, a plausible case, I donate $1,000 to your favorite charity. It's just not going to happen. First of all, the Chinese, yes, the Chinese are investing in clean energy. They're also, opening 50, they're also opening 50 coal plants a week. I'm sorry, a month. 50 coal plants a month open in China. So the question is not science. The question is science married with practicality and political reality. So. I'm not an expert. I can't tell you exactly what the science is. I can tell you, in the past, if we invested in technology, we can solve all kinds of human problems better than we think we can. If we depend on governments to do that, through coercive rules and regulations and caps on economic growth, you will see a political backlash worse than France. They raise diesel fuel taxes this much in France which says it's the great supporter of clean energy. They're burning the homes of elected officials in France this weekend. They're picking up cobblestones from the streets for the first time since 1789. Now, I'm not saying there's going to be a second French Revolution, but I know some people want it. Gee, I want to go in three minutes. I'm sorry. I think you've gotten my drift. <laughs> yes, in the way in the back. Two very quick questions. And then the lady in the back, too, after. I didn't mean to. Two slide. very quick questions. First, the disarray in the cabinet ongoing. How is that affecting the functioning of the government in real terms? And the second one is the Mueller investigation. What next? Oh, Mueller investigation. Ah, look, that would take 10 minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you afterwards. I, I just cannot possibly 
go into the complexities of the Mueller investigation, except it probably will finish in March or May. It'll probably have a report that will be leaked, and there will be an attempt in Congress to impeach Trump, and it will benefit the Democrats to the extent that they keep the, the issue alive. It will hurt the Democrats to the extent that they look as if they're obsessing about it the way Clinton, the Republicans obsessed about Clinton's impeachment 20 years ago this month. 20 years ago today, Bill Clinton was impeached. So that's all I'm going to say on that. I'll talk with you in greater length about that. I don't want to waste 10 minutes of everyone's time on the complexities. And the first question was the cabinet. Oh, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. <laughs> Uh, the Trump cabinet is actually more empowered when they're in office, the, for whatever period of time they are, than any cabinet in recent history. Have you ever heard the term potted plant? You know, someone's just a potted plant in an office, they don't really have a function. Well, for most presidents since Richard Nixon, the cabinet has been a potted plant. You know, this 25-year-old White House aide will call up the cabinet secretary and say, the White House and the president want you to do X. You will do this by 5 p.m. And you go do it. Trump's White House is so disorganized, and the people there are sometimes only 23 years old, that the cabinet officials are actually being left to their own devices to pursue you know, Trump policies as they see fit. If you don't believe me, ask Betsy DeVos at Education, ask um, Sonny Perdue at Agriculture, whole kind. They actually are doing just fine. Now, they may get fired next week, but you know that's occupational hazard. The lady in the back. The GDP um, increase of 4% is sustainable within Trump. Could you stand up because I can't hear you? I'm sorry. Do you think the 4% GDP growth rate is sustainable? Over the long run. Over Trump's term. Well, I think it would be a stretch given the current volatility of the market that Trump has caused because of the tariffs and the fact that all recoveries end and the fact that the Federal Reserve is going to continue to increase interest rates. No, it probably can't be sustained quarter after quarter, but I think in several quarters it will reach 4% or close to it, and it's a heck of a lot better than 2%. And by the way, economic growth actually does make a real life impact in improving people's lives and making it easier for them to keep their families together and all kinds of other things. Economic growth is not a cure-all or a panacea, but it is a sign of a healthier society. Yes. Would you believe that uh, Trump running America as a business rather than a country would be better for them, as it is, as you say? Well, the fallacy there is that anyone can run America like a business. Wrong. The biggest mistake anyone of large wealth who runs for president makes is when they say, I want to run America like the business I run. <laughs> yeah. Politics has nothing to do with business. If you're the CEO, you do anything you want. Ask Les Moonves of CBS. <laughs> I mean, he did anything he wanted, and he did it, got away with it for 20 years. Um, so, no, it's preposterous to run America like a business. Politics is a, in the business world, consumer choice means if you want a tie, you go in, or a scarf, you go into a store, you can get any kind of tie you want. That's real choice. And you and a bunch of other people can send market signals, and the companies will respond, or some company will respond. In politics, at least in my country, you're presented with two choices, the evil of two lessers often, and it's column A and column B, and there's no consumer protection laws. There's no laws against misrepresentation or fraud about the product. You can't hold the product to its promises. So the notion that you can run the American government and all of its complexities, including national defense, like a business, is just, it's just not the case. Yes? I was wondering what the prospects are for a Trump second term, given the results of the military. Well, I think I already addressed that, that I think that he, there's about a 35% chance he doesn't run. We can go into the details of that. Why? Um, I think he has a slightly, just under 50% chance of winning a second term if he does run. And that's largely because his base is holding firm and because the Democrats are more likely than not to nominate someone who's more left-wing than Hillary Clinton was, and she was hurt by her lack of moderation. So in a nutshell, and I can discuss this with you in greater detail afterwards, um, one in three chance he doesn't run, slightly less than 50 percent chance he wins re-election if he does. Uh, you, already, did you, you already asked a question. I'm sorry. 
Well, yeah. after, <laughs> sir, after, after everyone else asks a question. I believe so, I'm sorry? I believe you're quite right, yeah. I'll be last. Right. Well, right okay, I, I, that's why I'm going to get to everyone else who hasn't asked a question. Yeah. The last one, and then, then, then we can talk privately. Yes. Um, um, so uh, I think I, I thought of one friend Trump has, Mr. Alex Jones. But <laughs> no, actually, they don't like each other. They don't. No, okay. they don't. <laughs> My question was. Trump uh, thinks Alex Jones is crazier than he is. It's a, it's a toss-up. No, no, he thinks. I, I'm saying what Trump's opinion is. Okay. How do you think Trump has changed the future of politics in the United States? Um, will it, will America just go back to the old way it was before, after he leaves, or has he actually fundamentally changed the way politicians? You know, this, this is, and I think Colette actually pointed me in your direction. This is the perfect question to end this on, because the answer is, will someone in Canada, in the U.S., in Britain? in Sweden, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in South Africa, will someone rise up with a more coherent, balanced, substantive answer to how you have an equilibrium between the interests of the anywheres and the somewheres? Because just remember, even if you're an anywhere and in this room, you're 20 to 25 percent of the population. The somewheres are between 50 and 60 percent of the population. There's a blending in the rest. You, regardless of whether you're anywhere or somewhere, this is a political phenomenon, whether you call it populism or backlash or whatever. This is a political phenomenon that is worldwide. And I don't necessarily have the answer to that, but I do know that someone will either rise up and answer this question in a responsible way and mitigate Trump's approach, or they won't. And that will be this, lay the seeds for even greater conflict. Thank you. Thank you.